jumping, jumping, them boys are the something. They just spent like two or three weeks out the country. Them boys up to something, they just got to stop it. How's it going, guys? Welcome. Uh, we're excited to have you here uh, to on Free Academy Live. This is actually our second episode, so super cool. I'm Jared Reyes. This is Sean Megan, and uh, we'll kind of jump right in. I think uh, Sean's coming all the way from New Zealand, so pretty exciting uh, to to have him as part of the Free Academy and uh, kind of hear a lot about what he's up to now. Yeah, sure, man. It's awesome. Um, Jared and I both spent some time on the sailboat. Uh, with Michael during um, his whole time going from Texas to the Bahamas and back or Texas to the Caribbean and back uh, went as far as Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands at some points. And uh, we nonstop talk about the effects of um, just like shattering the typical American dream and um, yeah, yeah. And, and putting ourselves in those extreme travel situations um, and how that's played out for us. And I think that's something we kind of want to jump into on this talk as well as other various topics. Yeah. And I think, uh, well, I guess, you know, I, I, I said this during one of, so, you know, our buddy Michael, he's on his, he's selling his book right now, kind of on a book tour throughout the U S at the moment. He'll be at Anarchapoco in February. So he's getting beyond the U S to, to talk, sell his book, sell book diaries too, which is about the sailing trip, but also all his adventures leading up to it and whatnot. But, at uh, one of his book things, you know, we've all kind of mentioned some of what we got out of the sailing trip. And mm -hmm. I think we could have, uh, you know, we could have so many conversations, you know, and they could all be so different because, um, I mean, I just got so much out of the trip. But I think the one of the cool things is we all have some, like this big ideological, like overlap in our beliefs. But if you asked each one of us before the trip what our primary motivation for doing it was, I bet they'd all be different. You know, so even though we share a lot of beliefs, we all jumped on that boat, I think, for different reasons, at least the primary reason. And I think that's right. so fascinating. Like, I think my primary reason I jumped on the boat was, uh, I mean, it's hard to, looking back, it's hard, but I, I think the biggest thing was like the isolation of it because when I was on the boat it was just me and Michael and I had never really put myself in a situation like that and I'd for forgotten that was like the main fear I had but then when I go back and I reread my journal that's all I write about on the plane ride from when I went to go meet up with him in Miami is all I was writing about was like I've never been isolated like this before I'm really excited uh, to combat this fear and whatnot and uh, so I think that was probably my biggest reason from the jump, what do you think yours was? Man, mine is probably um, just butting heads against authority. Like I had, yeah. I was raised in a situation where um, I was the youngest child of three. Um, and so there was always this hierarchy and I was always just being delivered orders, you know, and I never, never really got to, I, it, it was, I, it's like I spent my whole life just like butting heads against this hierarchy essentially. And so that was another form of it. And, um, you know, so like I said, um, in one of Michael's book releases, like I left wanting to show all the people that said that we couldn't do it, that we could, and to prove something, you know, to prove something t to them and then blow their minds. But the, in the end, the most important piece of the whole journey was that I blew my own mind. Like I didn't, I, growing up in the States, you know, our American dream, quote unquote, is that you come out of college, you get a nice paying job and then you get a family and a house and car and dog and all that. And that's yeah. the end of it. So when I'm 22 and sailing on a boat thousands of miles to places that I hadn't even traveled to on a plane, I kind of like shattered all of my expectations for what my life would be. Um, and I think the biggest effect at the end of the trip was that I started to take ownership for my biography. You know, like I wasn't no longer was I just going with the flow in some quote unquote dream that was thrust upon me that I just assumed I had to follow. But now I took full and complete responsibility for myself and realized that like, look, it's either you do this now or you, you will be the one regretting it later. And you know, there's nobody else to blame but yourself. Um, and so I've kind of taken that lesson to heart and yeah, just continue traveling on afterwards. And um, yeah. And then ended up in New Zealand reluctantly and yeah i'll explain that story here in a bit 
it's yeah, pretty wild. That's, so that's fascinating. You know, I think it was the same thing for me. And you know? I remember when I told, when I decided I was going to do it, you know, and I, and I told Mike and I committed, you know, and he had a lot of people that had said or expressed interest, but, right. but then they would flake out, you know, and when I committed, you know, he's a little like, okay, I'm, you know, I, yeah, excited, but a little hesitant. Right. To that I'd actually get on that boat, but I remember committing to him. And then I started, you know, I told, I called my mom and I was like, Hey mom, you know, I know I'm going to Europe and then I'm going to be in Honduras, but uh, I wanted to let you know after those trips, uh, I'm going to go on a sailing trip with my buddy, Michael Fielding. And she had heard his name a little bit, but not that much, you know? And she's like, well, who's Michael again? I told her. <clears throat> and uh, she's like, what do you mean sailing? Like, where are you guys going to go? And I was like, well, I think I'm going to end up with him somewhere in Miami and then try and make it to South America. And I remember her being like, do you even know how to sail? And I was like, no. <laughs> Kind of, you know, I, like I went out there for a day and like got the basics, but you know, I, and I, and she's like, isn't this hurricane season? And I was like, yeah, it is hurricane season, you know? And she's like, what the hell are you doing? And she's like, I don't think this is a good idea. And I was like, mom, you know, I love you and I, I respect everything you have to say, but like I called out of respect for, for you, but not really asking permission. Like uh, this is something I feel like I need to do. And right. I just, it was like terrifying and exciting and she wasn't convinced I was actually going to do it, I think. And that was the response I got from all my friends. Like when I was in Europe, I went on this Europe trip with 39 other people. And uh, when I told them, you know, I think they all, they, cause they'd ask, well, what are you doing after this? And most of them had already committed to jobs once they got back from Europe. Uh, and so this was like their little recess before they jumped into real world. Whereas me, I was viewing it as this is, this is just the beginning of what I want the rest of my life to be. Yeah. And I would tell them when they would ask, you know, what, what was up? I was like, Oh, well, I got a couple trips planned after this. And they would hear the sailing thing. And there's like, there's no way you're going to sail from there to South America during hurricane season with like almost no experience and everything. So I had a little bit of that. Like, uh, I want to show people that I, I, I'm going to do what I said, you know? So I had yeah. some, no, everyone's doubting that I'll actually get on this boat. And right. I need to prove it to myself that I was actually going to do it. And thank God right. I did because it, it's so empowering. Like I feel like I, I just learned so much about my capabilities and how, as you said, we can take control of our own life. You know, you can actually find a way to live out all these passions and all these ideas and dreams and these crazy uh, adventures. We can actually do it. And I think getting on the sailing, going on the sailing trip specifically, prove to myself that like that we can do it you know you we just jumped on a boat I think almost really none of us had the appropriate level appropriate level of experience you know to do a trip like that and we all jumped on and yeah you know, screwed up a thousand times but we made it you know yeah yeah I think it illuminates like a, a very um you know a very fine lesson in life that there's not much that really separates um the winners from the losers and the successful people from the unsuccessful people. It's just the simple things like you're saying, like staying true to your word and challenging yourself to the fullest and working really hard to do that. You know, it's not like it was we say this all the time. And when we talk about it, it's like, we, we only highlight the good parts, but man, it was, it was work to be out there in such hardcore isolation and, you know, be sailing for three days at a time and spin a 360 and not see any land like it gets a bit yeah. depressing and you get a bit scared and you yeah. get a bit excited it's a little bit of everything it's a mental drain and especially when you've just spent 22 years of your life you know what 18 of those 22 years in classrooms and stuff like that for the majority of the day like yeah it's a big shock to the system but um yeah, I think that's that was one of the biggest things for me. It's like, you know, you are capable of blowing your own mind and, you know, it's actually going to work out you work out for you much better in the long run the quicker you do that. Um because yeah, you know, now that we did that at 22 and 23, we have the rest of our 20s to, you know, add on to that experience and it just makes that experience that much sweeter because we know that that was the beginning and that was the you know, the initial change that just led us to the next steps and the next steps and the next steps. And so when we're, when we're say 35, 
walk in the Great Wall of China, we know where that began from. And say when we're 65 and we've, you know, who knows, like just done another big sale or even raised a family or, um, you know, just developed a community that's that's really intent on freedom and helping each other out. Like we know where all those ideas where all those ideals and ideas rather were developed. Yeah. Um, and I think that just makes all of this a little bit sweeter too. Yeah. I mean, it's just, I think, I think, you know, one, it was proving people wrong. Part of it though, is just the proof of concept that you can do something or for me, it was, I could do something that everyone thought was a bad idea, but <laughs> that admitted that it sounded cool, but like that it was, a bad idea and that I should be terrified and to be frank I mean I yeah. definitely it was a scary adventure like I I'm not gonna allude or overshadow the fact that at times it was very scary and I, I did have to face a lot of my fears head-on but it did prove to myself that I can do something that everyone else thinks is a horrible idea and has to end in disaster and it just yeah. amazing and one of the most unique experiences of my life yeah and have once you have that confidence that just because everyone says something is a bad idea once you have the confidence to say no but i this is important for me i can do it right filters into everything else but so many people you know maybe they have that same dream but they hear a few people tell them you shouldn't do this like that's not smart and then they they may bail on it um and i i was probably one of those people capable of bailing on on those sort of ideas you know until I decided to get on the boat anyway and you know like you said I blew my own mind in combat right. and confronting all these fears and nothing's been you know I guess there's nothing more exciting or fulfilling than when you take a fear head on and realize that it was silly to have it to begin with right right and I think uh, that illuminates your threshold um, you know it really defines it the threshold of uh, what's something that I'm capable of, you know, like, cause now when you have a pretty far fetched idea, say it's even like a business idea or something like, you know how hard you've pushed yourself before. So you'll have a much better idea of what it is you're capable of um, than you probably would have before. And yeah, when you were saying, talking about um, people telling you that the idea was crazy, I remember specifically a couple um, friends from back home. Um, if you could call them that saying, like once we were leaving for our long trip, I think this was the one from Puerto Rico to Dominican to the uninhabited island in Bahamas and then Florida. Um, they were saying, you know, why would we want to go on that sailboat? Like I'm just, it's hot and you're going to be sweaty and like we can just be comfortable here and our house is here. And I'm like, oh, that's exactly the reason why I want to go on that boat. Like I've lived yeah. in this comfortable house my whole life and I see how numb it's made me and how sure great things can come from it. But you know, for me at that particular time, that was the challenge that I needed. Um, and yeah. yeah, yeah, super yeah. thankful for it. I'm glad we all did it. And yeah, and it, it's amazing. I think to see now, like, um, with say Michael writing the book, and you know, you doing the things that you've done since that sale, and myself as well, and um, us continually exploring afterwards. It's not like we let up after that sale, and we talk about that, but that was just a central. Um, event that kind of led us on our own paths and stuff like that. And I think we're, you know, as of recent in particular, like we're really understanding how we're going to each go our own ways after this. And, you know, but there's like you're saying, there's a central overlapping, um, like theory or concept that like keeps us driven towards this idea of freedom and stuff like that, where all of our skills and uh, the, and the directions that we're pursuing are all coming back together and, you know, really helping each other out. Um, which reminds me like recently I was talking to a, um, a big con conservationist here in New Zealand. She's huge, huge, huge on, on conservation and saying that that's what the human race needs and that's, what's going to solve our problems. And I'm huge on, the government side and, um, you know, reducing that whole influence. And, um, you know, it really made me think like, even though she's going that direction and I'm going this direction, I think in the end, our ultimate goal is that we want the human species to all have the best lives possible. And, yeah. and not only that, to continue to continue the human species in general. Um, and so if we're all able to come together and see the ultimate goal, like, 
and you know we're going to work together as a team as opposed to saying this particular way of doing it is the best or this particular way of doing it is the best um and yeah so i think you know we're we're really realizing that as a group and it's it's going to help us going forward yeah no doubt i think <clears throat> so much of it is empowering the individual to pursue their own passion and their creativity and their dreams you know whereas what we what we've been brought up i think tyler is the first person i heard use this particular phrase at one of the book things but he said like this this prefabricated life you know that right them that you know i think most developed nations probably this is true for but i'll just speak for the u.s since that's the only thing i can really speak intelligently on um, as far as growing up there but yeah i mean they, there's so much energy put into this is how it works you go to school you get your high school diploma if you can if you're fortunate right. enough you go to college then you get a job then you, everything you said and it's it's like this very prefabricated life and anytime you are tempted to step out of that I think you're ostracized to some extent. I know I've personally, I feel like I've experienced a lot of ostracism based on the fact that I did really well in school and it kind of set up these expectations. You know, I think it actually, if I had done poor, not as well in, in college, <clears throat> I think it would have been easier for those, my loved ones around me and even my friends to accept the, the idea that I wasn't going to go down this normal path. But yeah. By, by doing so well in school, everyone like, it reaffirmed everyone's expectations and made them very strong that like, oh, I was made to fit into the bubble. And <clears throat> anyway, I felt ostracized, you know, and I, <clears throat> I still get, you know, some of my family doesn't get it. Some of my friends definitely don't get it. <clears throat> Man, what's going on? Um, and, and I think one of the core tenets of what we're about um, as a group, you know, all of us that went on the sailing trip and that are trying to be a part of the free academy and whatnot is just to empower the individual and to say that, yeah, I mean, think about what you want to do, what you're passionate about and go for it. You can do it. We know you can do it. And don't let these right. people tell you that you're not capable of it. And yeah. if, if that was done on a, on a grander scale, I think like we're missing out on so much ingenuity and innovation and creativity. And because if you don't fit into this box, it, you know, you get ostracized instead of encouraging people to, to do what they see in their head. Um, I think, so what you're saying about the conservationist, you know, if you guys might not, you're fighting for the same goal, but in different ways, you know, she's passionate to such an extreme about this, right? But if, if we could just pursue or encourage everyone to find what they're passionate about or what their dreams are and just to go for them, everyone right. would more but I feel like if once you step outside of that box people there's no encouragement there it's very it's few and far between um, you know as far as who's telling you and saying yeah you can do it and I think we're just losing so much we're losing passion we're losing happiness we're losing uh, new innovative ideas because we're pushing people uh, into this machine that just yeah. turns you know and it's and it's sad and I think my biggest push besides just the isolation of it to get on the boat was I had already, you know, had some internships, got horribly depressed. I, I realized I couldn't work in an office. Like it was just, I couldn't right. do it. And um, I was fighting against, you know, the, this work life balance that people have in the U S it didn't make sense to me. Um, but, and I think I'm happier for, for, for not falling into that trap, but, um, you know, if it works for some people, that's great. I just want to encourage people to do what, what they want and to take hold of their life and, and to, to organize it for themselves instead of relying on other people's expectations to figure out what they need to do. Right. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, it's with the whole work life balance thing. Like, you know, if you don't, if you don't bring it upon yourself to, pursue your passion and kind of, um, you know, like, I guess what I'm trying to say is that you're going to be used for somebody else's means. Like if you're not taking your, if you're not taking responsibility for your own biography and your own, um, you know, your own passions, like you're saying, like, like, um, say, like a, make your biography an autobiography, you know, make control what, going on you know instead of letting everyone else write it for you 
Yeah, exactly. Because like, say, um, you know, if you don't choose what it is you want to, what it is you want to pursue in life, then you're just going to go accept a job that pays. And yeah. you know, maybe that job is at Amazon or something else. So you're just some sort of robot for the Amazon people and their passions. And therefore like your passions just get smothered in the meantime. Like they don't, you know, nobody's, and it's not necessarily their fault because you're the one who's, who put yourself in that situation, who passively just floated in there and let somebody use your body in order for their, you know, to be a means to their end. Yeah. Um, so I think in, and in that regard, you know, it's not necessarily a bad thing to work for somebody. Like I work here in New Zealand for somebody, but I'm happy about it because our, our interests align and I know what their long-term goals are and they know what my long-term goals are. And we're both helping each other get to those goals and reach them. Um, so it's not like, it's not like in, in the process, my passions are being smothered. Um, if anything, they're being enhanced and I'm helping them enha enhance their passion and, mm. and reach their goals. So, um, yeah, yeah. I think it's, you know, literally it's, that is one of the, one of the things of utmost importance in life is to, you know, yeah, take responsibility for your biography and find out what it, what your passion is, even if it's ever changing, which, you know, it probably will be throughout your life. Um, just go for it and make sure that, um, make sure that everything that you're doing in the meantime kind of supports this, this ultimate goal of yours. Yeah. Now I think it's funny cause people, I think ask themselves so many questions like, okay, I'm, you know, I'm 25, almost 26. Where should I be at in life? All these things. And they ask themselves, you know, they evaluate religion. They, they ask themselves all these questions. I think a lot of people, um, my perception of a lot of people, you know, I don't want to say it as a fact, but my perception is a lot of people don't ask themselves maybe the most important question, which is just, what do I want to get out of my life? Right. And I don't know. I, I, I'm operating my life so far post college with almost no plan. Like I'm kind of winging it, but I have a, there's a general theme that I know I want my life to represent and right. anything in pursuit of that theme I'm going for, but I don't have, you know, next year I want to do this, this and this, you know, it's not scripted, but I have a main idea and and it took a while to craft that main idea. Once I realized I didn't want the normal work life, mm -hmm. uh, it was a very depressing realization because I was like, okay, well, I, I didn't feel like I had an example of an alternative lifestyle in my life. So I didn't know, I said, okay, I know I don't want this, but what's left, like, what do I do? And crafting that main idea or that theme was really a, a very challenging question for me to answer. But I think it was the most important question for me to answer because as you mentioned, if you don't put thought into what you want to get out of your life or, you know, some basic principle like that. It's very easy to just float into a good paying job and then float. And before you know it, five years has passed. You're still there. You know, you got a few promotions along the way. So you're making more money. It gets harder. I feel like it's easy to get sucked into, um, you know, sucked into these life situations where you just float by and before you yeah. know it, so much time has passed and yeah. the long, get sucked yeah. in the harder it is to ever pull yourself yeah. out right right it's so dangerous yeah. like this black i think i think in particular for us you know being in our 20s like uh i read this book recently by meg j it's called the defining decade and you can see her ted talk online um but you know in popular media um all the 20 somethings like it's you know, it's advertised to us that uh, our thirties are our new twenties and that, you know, pretty much our twenties, you know, they're just wasteful years and you can do whatever you'd like with them. But I think that's, you know, that's so far from the truth. Like these are the years where you're literally building like identity capital and building up skills so that by the time the clock strikes 30 and, you know, people are freaking out, rushing to have children or rushing to yeah. jump into careers. Like, like you, you have built up skills that, you know, you can relax. You're, you're 30. You're like, you're, you're making good coin. You've already kind of, you know, developed uh, your passions and your interests and you know what sort of line you want to follow given that you've taken risk and, you know, kind of um, done some soul searching and stuff like that. And, um, you know, you're 30 years old and you're not having to work a job that you could have worked when you were 22 or 23. 
um, because you've already put in those hard yards at a young age and kind of uh, worked your way up, you know? Um, so I think, yeah, I think that's kind of just a terrifying idea to be 30 years old and being bossed around by like a 25 or 26 year old when you know you could have been in that position at that age or earlier. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think there's, yeah, some, something really important to be said about like taking this time to explore and, you know, whether that's work related or travel related, but explore for a purpose, like you're saying, you know, kind of get a general idea of what it is you want in life and how you want to, you know, how you want to go about living your life and, and what it is you want to accomplish during it. And, um, yeah, you know, go for it then. Yeah. And I think it's, um, it's okay to get off course of your theme, but I think it's just important to be cognizant of your theme enough to not let yourself get so far that you get sucked into that, that, that hole where, you know, you're just drifting by and, time escape right. and then you have that moment later in life where you you probably start to realize that you got so off course that you didn't really make for yourself what you had hoped and I see that in my friends um, you know and I worry for them because when they hear about what I'm doing they like some of my thoughts or whatever or they see other people going on adventures or traveling or you know just doing whatever makes them happy they see people around them that appear to be happy and maybe they're missing out on some of that uh, I worry for them because they'll they'll admit to me, you know, I'm 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 not really happy or it's this, but it's so hard for them to pull themselves out because now they've already sunk time in, and and you know I'm like, well, that's a sunk cost, but you gotta you gotta just worry about now moving forward. You know, are you on a path to where you think you'll get happy, or or do you recognize that you're on a path where you you're, you're not gonna like it? You know, because I'm all for putting in time. You know, and maybe sacrificing some happiness when you think you're positioning yourself for the future that you want. Right, but, right. But I have a lot of friends that will admit they're, they're not really very happy now. And also, when they project forward, they don't think they're really on track to be happy later. But it's right. still hard to pull out, like, pull out of that situation and, and figure out what they really want. And I think part of that is fear because um, the fear of – what if what you really want isn't what other people's want for you? Uh, right. I, you know, it goes back to my family. They had different expectations for me, and luckily they've, they've become very supporting, uh, at least my immediate family. But my extended family, you know, I, I still face ostracism uh, about my actions because it's not their concept of what a happy life is, and so they're not very supportive of it. Um, yeah. That's yeah, the like biggest fear I think I have. Just getting sucked in that hole, you know, and that's why I think I'm so conscious or I try to be of, of what I want because it's so easy to get sucked yeah. into that hole. Yeah, no, I mean, you just raised a great point for me too. Like whenever I stepped on the sailboats at 22, I wasn't necessarily the most happy 22-year-old if, if that's even a thing, you know. You're usually pretty lost at that age from what I hear. <laughs> and uh, But yeah, like looking back on that, you know, it's clear and evident that at this point, um, having traveled extensively since and having found, you know, come here and found a good job, found someone that, um, that, like I said, my interests align with that I'm working for and I see a great future going forward. It's like we took the, that's what a piece of that sale was for me. It was like, this is the beginning of me putting in the hard yards for me to, to be able to look back whenever I'm older and say, look, yeah, you know, I did it and be proud of something that I did. Cause at that point, 22 years old like all I had done was follow what exactly what society had told me you know and I just yeah like like I said from 5 to 18 and in, in a government school and then you know breaking out of religion was great for me at about like 16 years old but then yeah. after that you know 18 to 22 getting tricked essentially tricked into going to college and assuming that was a great thing for me and then getting to the end of it and realizing hey that was was <laughs> such a waste of my time yeah. Um, it was at that point where I was like, look, you know, this is, this is the first step I can take to directly butt heads with, you know, authority, just like I was talking about the whole theme of my childhood. And, uh, you know, it's not guaranteed that it's going to be safe or anything like that, but you know, this is your first opportunity to actually take a hold of your biography for yourself and, and give it a go and see how it works out. And, 
yeah, funny thing was in the end it worked out, you know, it's just an exponential joy that, that, you know, seeps out of that situation. And, uh, yeah, um, I've, these last couple of years have just been amazing and I'm excited to see where it goes from here. You know, like look how passionate we are in our mid twenties of, about what we're doing and, you know, just give it a little bit of time for us to collect more skills and more resources and more adventures. And yeah, it's, it's going to be, you know, we're going to be really productive members of society and, um, you know, really, uh, help push the bar, um, in the areas that we're associated with. So Mm -hmm. I'm excited about that. And, you know, and I want to say now more than ever, like, do we need people like us in society? Because it's just, you know, with all the news and everything that's happening, it's just crazy as ever. So, yeah, I mean, I think one of the biggest things I hope that something about what I'm doing and part of the reason I'm, I'm, I try and be outspoken about it. I, I broadcast on social media, you know, one of the biggest reasons I'm doing that is because when I realized I didn't want what was expected of me, I didn't, as I said earlier, I didn't really feel like I had a good example in my life of an alternative life or, or of someone that I felt broke free of the mold and, and found what was, you know, important to them. You know, I actually did. I had Michael in my life, but we weren't that close at the time. So I didn't know, you know, but I felt like I didn't have that example. And, and, you know, I, not to be grandiose about what I'm doing. I'm not, I'm not doing anything special. You know, I'm just kind of living a life and trying to find my own happiness and, uh, and those sorts of things. But if any positive can come from it, and part of the reason I'm so vocal about it is maybe someone sees what I'm doing and it helps encourage them to soul search and, and maybe question what they really want because it's right, easy right. emotions because everyone else, you're doing what everyone else is doing. And so you just assume it's what's right for you. But until you break free or have that moment of clarity where you say, you know, what do I really want? Um, it's, it's just, you know, I keep talking about it because it blows my mind, but just getting sucked into that vortex and not questioning it until so much time has passed. Um, right. I, I'm, I think part of the reason I'm outspoken about it, or the biggest is I hope that maybe there's one person out there that hears something or whatever. And just not that I'm special, but just, I'm doing something a little bit different and it encourages them to maybe consider or trust in themselves to, to do their own thing. You know, you don't have to fall into the path. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is cause you know, I'm living below the poverty line for the most part, uh, from an income standpoint, Michael is a lot of us are, right. uh, and I'm more than comfortable actually, um, at this income level. I, I think I could be happy for a long time, but I was talking to my mom cause she still kind of hopes, uh, that in some way, shape or form, this is a phase cause she wants me to be financially successful and, and those things. I think that's natural for a parent to want that. And I was telling her, I was like, you know, I'm not convinced even though I'm basically choosing to be poor now or uh, that, that it doesn't mean I won't be financially successful later because yeah. you know, I'm following my passions and I'm surrounding myself with people who are doing the same thing. And when you do that, you're going to end up, um, I think, meeting people that are going to put you in a place to succeed. Whereas if I just become like a, a cog in the system, I'm just kind of getting by and, uh, you know, if it's not something I'm passionate about, I feel like it's harder to, to make yourself economically successful when, when you're just trying to get by. Right, right. And, you know, and you can have economic success, but uh, if you're reliant on somebody else for that all the time, then that in and of itself isn't, you know, doesn't really define success to me. Like, yeah. I would like to, you know, I would rather say like make 30, 40 grand a year, but be able to do it on my own terms and know that I'm doing it. uh, Like I'm helping the world by doing what I'm doing than make 60 or 70, just being a cog for somebody else and not necessarily gaining skills towards my ultimate goal. Uh, I want to say something real quick on what you said earlier, like uh, being able to influence somebody by telling your story and being outspoken on social media you know, you put in the hard work to do what it is you did. And so even if it's not you influencing some somebody right this moment, think when you have children or grandchildren, if that's something you, you want, like just sharing that story with them and the generational ripple effect that these 
actions can have, you know, and, and taking yeah. control of your biography and autobiography, like you're saying. Um, it's not that it has to pay off necessarily right now. It's great if it does, but you have, you carry that with you for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. And the people that really do latch onto that story, they tell people about you and they tell people about you. And so it's just, it's like, you're a, you're a walking, I don't even know. It's like, it's just like this whole, just, it's like empowerment that radiates from you, you know, no matter where you go and no matter how old you are. So I think that's like, yeah, it's something that's really beneficial for a person's life. And to know, like, just to know that, just to know that fact that that's what you are, it just makes you want to add on to that and keep going and keep going. Yeah. I mean, it's just, and what you said about my thing, I'm so comfortable living off so little money that I know money's never going to be necessary for my happiness, which is a really awesome feeling. Um, yeah. But, you know, obviously more money is better and whatnot. But uh, I liked what you said, which is that, you know, obviously I, <laughs> um, I think sometimes people mistake my message <clears throat> that I don't want to do the normal work life and things like that as, as some sort of stance that like, you know, making money is bad or something. That's clearly not, not, my 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 message or my beliefs or anything it's more um i don't want to i'm not money's not worth you know i, I don't want to sacrifice my freedom for money there's there's not amount of money that that trade-off's worth it you know so that's why like you said acquiring skills to where you can you can be your own economic engine and you know you, you have your own freedom you know i don't want to get caught in a thing where i'm making good money but like you know, one of the biggest things, even if you don't mind the work-life balance traditionally in the U.S. right now, where you, you know, maybe you don't even mind the Monday through Friday eight to five thing. Um, but I have friends that don't mind that, but then they want to take a trip and they're like, man, I only got a week of vacation. You know, it's like all these other strings attached right? that just make that not work for me. I don't want to be in a position where I have, I'm financially capable to do a trip. You know, I have yeah. every ounce is, is lined up and I could do this incredible thing that I'm really passionate about, but I can't because I don't have enough vacation days or something. You know, I just don't want to put myself in a situation that that trade offs never worth it. Um, and I think that's why it's for me. I don't I wouldn't mind being used to help someone else achieve their ends. You know, obviously, you know, like you were saying, you and I think you were talking about Brian. huh? Yeah, yeah helping each other out and pushing each other in some way, shape or form, uh, or inspiring each other in small ways here and there. Uh, I don't, I, I don't mind, you know, that relationship sounds great. It's just the money. There's not a price tag on my freedom, I guess. And I, I find the standard work life to be too big an encroachment on my freedom and my flexibility for it to be worthwhile to me at this point. Maybe I'll change my mind later, but yeah. Yeah, and I think at the same time, it's like, uh, although you choose that, clearly you're you're like taking another route to try to make it work for you because, say, you know, there's people out there who want family and children and grandchildren, and you have to have resources in order to raise a family. Like, it's very expensive, and it would just be, uh, it would be very negligent to try to go into a situation and have your child, you know, camp in a tent with you or something like that because of you know, because you're okay with not having coin and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, so, so it's not like that. It's not like you're just saying like not have it, but don't, don't put yourself in a situation that you don't enjoy or that you're not passionate about to, you know, in just for the cash. Um, if it's not going to help you in the long run, if you're just going to have to restart later or you're just going to suffer from depression, you know, yeah. this whole time going through life. Which, yeah, yeah I really understand. It makes sense. Don't get too far off your life's message for the sake of a little bit more money. You know, like right, right. Yeah, and Stefan Molyneux puts that real well. He's saying like, uh, in with families that where both parents work and they put their child in daycare nonstop. You know, rent out your child to this person that they're paying ten dollars an hour. He's like, just downsize the house. You know, rent an apartment for a couple years. It only takes a couple years for this child to gain you know um emotional clarity and you know you just raise this child for nine months in your belly so 
at least keep that nurturing, you know, that nurturing environment and that comfort around until the child is developed. And then you can, you know, then go work for, you know, more stability if that's something you need. But yeah, just like downsize in the meantime, it's in the long run, it's always going to be better to, to have spent the time as opposed to got a couple extra thousand dollars. Yeah. No, so. it's, I mean, that's a good point. They're basically outsourcing parenting. Yeah, no, that's exactly what they're doing. And it's, that's, yeah, that's and I, you know, I was in a similar situation and there's, you know, it's, it's strange not having that connection with your parent who, you know, and my parents provided for me. They, it's, you know, they, they like, we never had to worry about food being on our plate or monetary struggles or anything like that. But at the same time, like I was in daycare, like a lot of the time. And so it's, it's just kind of strange that that was a thing. Um, and if someone doesn't like speak up about it, it can just happen generationally too. You know, there's still people out there who are putting their kids in daycare nonstop when in government schools for that matter and through churches when we know like we, there's enough evidence to show this far that that has, you know, dismantled quite a few lives. Um, but just people not speaking up doesn't, doesn't help break the chain or change anything. Yeah. And I, and I do want to be sympathetic to the fact that obviously not everyone has the capacity to, to raise a child and, and not utilize daycare and, and whatnot. But if yeah. it's, you know, especially single parents, like my mom, she really didn't have, my dad was, you know, tremendous. He's always there for her. If she needed anything, he was there. So taking nothing away from that, but just if she was going to produce any income, you know, she, she had to put me somewhere. Um, right. and, you know, that I guess was doing the same, you know, he had a business to run and whatnot. So it's, I, there's instances where I get that it's a uh, necessity, but if, if you're capable of, of not doing it, I'm sure it makes a huge impact um, on the child. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, so you're in New Zealand now kind of doing your thing. We, uh, we went on the sailing trip, I, I guess to fill in the gaps between the sailing trip and now, um, well, one of the things I did recently, which is what I'm writing my book about, and uh, it's referenced a little bit in, in the end of Mike's book, is, you know, living in the woods here in Austin. Um, so to fill people in on that, I, after the sailing trip, you know, there's some other travels in there. Um, ended up in Dallas for a few years to try and, uh, you know, fam family health problems and, and uh, you know, just one thing led to another, and I ended up being in Dallas for a while. But, um, you know, escaped from that and then went and moved into the woods in Austin uh, with Michael. And it was an awesome adventure. We both lived in that particular woods for about five months. And it was a real cool adventure. It was a way for me to, I think, finally put to test, you know, I've always been into minimalism. And I've talked a lot about it. I think I was like a keyboard minimalist where I, you know, I sure did, I wrote a lot about it. But I, I don't think I really lived it very well. And... Yeah. Uh, I wanted to put it to the test and, you know, find out if I was full of shit or not <laughs> and uh, <laughs> see what's, you know, what's the bare minimum amount of things materially that I can have in my life and still, and still be happy. And, um, you know, there was that and there's a lot of other lessons and there's certainly some philosophical and political things that I was, uh, or apolitical, I guess I should say, uh, things that I was trying to test as well. But, um, that was one of the biggest things. It was an awesome experience. And so I'm writing a book about that experience um, and why the hell at age 25, I thought that'd be a cool idea uh, and what and whatnot. So that was cool. But that's, that's basically in a nutshell what I've been up to. Um, you went on some travels post sailing trip that ultimately led you to, to, you know, meeting some cool people in New Zealand and staying there for a while. You want to go into that a little bit? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I was, uh, immediately after we got back from the sales, I think it was um, November or something like that. And so I spent Thanksgiving and Christmas in um, in Texas, and it was kind of anticlimactic, honestly. Uh, we showed up after having just sailed for a month. We were pretty much starving for like the last week. Um, yeah, we spent a week on an uninhabited island uh, and just the most amazing stars and sunsets and yeah, and then we get home, and you know it's real nice for us to be home for the first couple of days, and then it's like, oh, I'm gonna go 
to work or what? You know, so <laughs> I definitely anticlimactic. Um, but after that, I kind of knew I was like, you know, all right, well, Texas, I've only lived in Texas my entire life. So I think it's about time to branch out and just see what's out there. Yeah. Um, so I'm fortunate enough to move in with my cousin who lives out in Northern California in Lake Tahoe. And uh, I spent some time out there just exploring and it was nice living in an area where there's just extreme beauty. And mm -hmm. uh, we would go hiking in the mountains, which is something that I hold dear to me to this day. Like I, I've done tons of hiking since and I never really got into hiking until then. Um, so yeah, that's been really beneficial for me. And, and now like when I, when I look into travels, hiking is something that I, you know, I'm not going to cities anymore. I'm going to hike places or, uh, yeah, yeah just pursue other activities that interest me now. Um, yeah. And then shortly afterwards I was, uh, I had the benefit of meeting up with another one of my friends from college and he has an uncle who has a salmon fishing lodge out in Alaska. And so I stayed in Alaska with him for about a month and a half. Um, and I think it was at that point, no, no, really a little like towards the end of California when I saw that my, me living in California wasn't really going anywhere. This, in this particular area, there was, it was just people working, um, doing tourist jobs roughly, um, just to live in that area. And, you know, the extreme beauty was great and that's something that I wanted in my life, but I wasn't going to work some underpaid job just to stay there. You know, I wanted the best of both worlds essentially. Um, so yeah, I went off to Alaska and, uh, oh, sorry. So yeah, at the end of California, I kind of said, well, I guess I'll just go on the run again. There's tons of the world that I still haven't seen. Um, and, and all of the trips that I had done thus far had been in big groups. So I was ready to do something alone and mm -hmm. have another similar challenge, you know, similar to the sailboat, just yeah. get out there alone and see what I can make happen essentially. Um, and oh and yeah i was into uh, i had gotten into meditation so there was just so happened to be a vipassana meditation retreat out there so i was like all right well that's it i'm going to new zealand um so i get out to new zealand after my alaska trip and um and yeah eventually i win this well so i i'm hitchhiking and i get picked up by this maori elder and maori are the indigenous people um here in new zealand and he's telling me about the financial woes and how the Europeans, you know, essentially came in and put them under their monetary paradigm. And so I'm just thinking like, well, Bitcoin had just recently blown up. And so I'm just like, well, why don't y'all put y'all's money into Bitcoin? So anyways, I just, I start Googling that night at his house about uh, Bitcoin New Zealand. And sure enough, the first ever Bitcoin conference in New Zealand was happening like a couple months from when I Googled that. Um, and I asked about it on meetup.com and a guy got back to me the next day and said, Hey, we're offering scholarships um, if you're interested. And so I applied, you know, I sent him an email tell him, telling him why I was interested and just talking about the fiat money uh, paradigm and whatnot. And uh, yeah, he hit me up a couple days later and said, Hey, you want it. Um, and so he tells me, I actually started doing a little bit of freelance work for him um, on the computer what like a couple weeks later and he said um he sent me a link one day and was like you know check out this guy's website he's the one who who will be covering your scholarship and he's who i'm working with uh, currently and uh, i look at the website on the about me page and it's it's a guy that had donated um for us to do our sailing adventure through puerto rico because we ran a gofundme um mm -hmm. online ad campaign and when I found that out, man, that was really strange. It was just like a whole full circle event. Um, so yeah, I ended up meeting up with this guy and um, at the Bitcoin conference, and he was real cool and a really interesting person in general too. And um, was fortunate enough to offer me a position out here um, because I was just kind of trying to get away from um, the whole U.S. paradigm and you know the American dream in general and. Uh, yeah, since then I've been out here and I'm living out here and working out here, uh, going to school out here currently, doing a um, a program um, in sustainability practice. So I'm learning a lot about horticulture as well as sustainability in general, um, which I think you know is crucial as far as uh, the earth goes. Um, but also it's made me think a lot more about the sustainability of the human species and how we're going to go about, um, you know, 
finding our way off this planet before you know the four and a half billion um, year mark comes up and we get too close to the sun. Um, so yeah, that's kind of you know. Long story short, that's how I ended up here in New Zealand. Yeah, that's crazy. I didn't realize that uh, that he had funded the GoFundMe for the sailing trip to. Little yeah, yeah, yeah. He donated us. Uh, what was it like? Like two hundred and sixty dollars or something like that. Um, just for a satellite phone. And uh, you know, he has he's done some investing before too, and they've been. Um, They've been, you know, some investments haven't turned out so well. And it was funny. One day I said to him, like, you know, you won't understand that what you did for us, all you had to do was give four little kids $260 and look how far it's gone, you know? Yeah. And yeah. It's, it's quite interesting. So yeah, it's, you know, we'll see where all of this takes me going forward. And um, yeah, it's nice to, um, you know, nice to be associated with some, some business and, and, uh, have that as well in my life, you know, cause it's just another area of pursuit. I really want to, you know, be able to gain resources for resources for myself while doing something, you know, providing a valuable service, but then taking some of those resources and, you know, um, doing exactly what he did to us, just giving it to kids who are clearly putting themselves out there and trying to make things happen in life. Um, kids or older people doesn't matter. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, it's got me real excited for. No, that's, you know, that's it goes back to what we were saying before. You know, I think, and all all of us in some way, shape, or form, I think are hoping. You know, me, Michael, you, Tyler, um, Ben. You know, we're all hoping to just encourage others. You know, Daniel, Julian, whatever, uh, to 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 do what they want to do and to find their path. You know, we're, our goal is just to help encourage other people to do what, what they want to do and to explore yeah. their own version of freedom and to identify yeah. what, what life is to them and, and to go for it. And I mean, I just think what you're doing in New Zealand is so awesome. And I know all of us have been talking about trying to find some time to get out there. Um, ideally sometime where we can all get out there together. Cause you know, we've met up now in person and we're all kind of like go our own way uh, and do our own thing. But we have, we seem like we're going to have these times where we all end up regrouping. And Austin was, yeah. has been one of those cities where we, you know, been, a lot of us, you know, found a way to regroup here and touch base. And I'm sure we're all now we're on that stage where we're all kind of slowly drifting back out into the world. And right, then I'm right. You know, we're going to find a way to reconnect. Um, but we've been talking about heading out to New Zealand. I think, think sometime around May-ish has been thrown around. So hopefully we get out there. Yeah, yeah, man, that'll be sweet. Yeah, it's cool to see, you know, with everybody going their own ways, it's been so damn interesting to see how how we penetrated almost like the mainstream of the whole freedom movement uh, in general, you know, like with you guys and uh, Brave New Books out in Austin and uh, Mike at Anarchapoco and me out here in New Zealand. Um, or yeah, and that's like only the beginning of it too. Like it's uh, it's gonna be just yeah. It gets me so excited to think about the future of it all. And and yeah. uh, you know, like what like we're saying, once we gain more skills and more resources, and we we're able to help other people out to get to the same um, position. Like yeah, it's um, it's quite exciting to look forward to. And yeah. No, it's awesome. You know, and that's one that's one of the coolest things about the freedom movement is how accessible everyone seems to be, you know, in the movie, you know, it's just, everyone's so excited to have other people opening their eyes to freedom and individuality that everyone I've tried to reach out to or interact with, no matter how well known has been incredibly responsive and, you know, open to helping. And it's, it's my favorite, it's probably my favorite part about the movement is just, you know, the, the ideas that lead people to it, um, are great, but then to see that they come through and you know help thy neighbor sort of very giving culture that it has for the most part. I mean, obviously, I'm sure there's some people in there that aren't as giving, but my experience has been you know, even the most well known of names are incredibly accessible, you know, at the push of an email or a phone call. And, um, you know, I'm just I feel like we're finally getting, as you said, we're we're starting to meet some of the people that are more well known in the movement and. 
uh, it's just been amazing to get involved with them and hopefully, you know, we can all do something to, to further it, but. Right. And, and all the new experiments that we're on the cusp of, you know, would say like encryption as well as like bitcoins and all the different altcoins coming out. Um, yeah, it's, it's just been insane. You know, like, like I was saying at the very beginning of this talk, when I was thinking, you know, say when I was 18 and thinking about what my life would be, just get a, a good job and then a wife and the house and the kids and everything like yeah. never could have even remotely imagined that I'd be involved with Bitcoin and just like the idea of turning the, turning our current ideas of money inside out. Um, and yeah and and not only that like um i'm real involved here in like local food movement and getting all my food from in in this region and none of it having herbicides or pesticides or any steroids or anything like that like um and and to be able to feel the effects of that too and like recognize every time i eat um how much of a ripple effect that has like it it just makes life so much more rewarding and so much more rich yeah, um, I could have ever imagined. So yeah, and um, yeah, just great, man. Yeah, man. Well, uh, it's been awesome talking to you. Glad we can uh, we were able to hop on on this on this call, and uh, I feel like this is a good place to leave it. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, I think so, man. I think so. Awesome. The next awesome. Peace, love, and anarchy. Yeah. See ya.